Fantastic Beasts 2 The Crimes of Grindelwald is the worst movie that I watched last year. And yes, that's counting Axum. I say this because a movie with this much money put into it has no right being this bad. I know this movie already did its rounds in November and everybody already knows it's bad, but since I saw it, I can't stop thinking about it. It's kind of beautiful how horrible it is. I was going to do a quickie on it when it came out, but I knew I needed to wait and give this movie its due course. So for those of you who haven't seen the last movie or just don't know your Harry Potter lore, let me recap it for you. Oh, and by the way, Warner Brothers is going to cuck me if I use too much footage, so whenever I get into my rants, I'm going to alter the footage like this or use pictures like this. All right, let's get started. What happens in the first Fantastic Beasts movie? So the Fantastic Beasts series is set 65 years before the Harry Potter saga. In this movie, we follow Pokemon master Noob Salamander. He goes around and gathers magical animals and writes about them and does other stuff with them, I guess. So he's on a trip to bring his Arizona Phoenix to Phoenix, Arizona, but he has an extended layover in New York City. While in New York, he gets into a bunch of shenanigans after some of his Pokemon get loose. He meets new friends like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, who's a normal non-magical human who's caught in the middle of all this goofy shit, Tina, an American magical cop, and her sister Queenie, who's the sexiest woman ever to be put on film. You prefer pie or strudel? You prefer strudel, huh, honey? Yeah, Negro. She can also read minds and she falls in love with Jacob. While this cute little story is happening, we have the side plot where we have Ezra Miller trying his very hardest to look at least a little bit ugly in this movie. Ezra plays an orphan boy with secret, dangerous, magical powers. He's actually a fantastic beast himself in a way, and he has a chance of fucking exploding and killing everybody if he gets too upset. And he gets upset a lot because the lady who runs the orphanage that he lives in is a huge bitch. Oh, and Colin Farrell is here too, and he plays an American wizard trying to tempt Ezra Miller to the dark side. <laughs> anyway, after some magical adventures, Newt tries to save Ezra from falling to the dark side and exploding, but he fails. Ezra blows up and he dies, and it's revealed that Colin Farrell is actually Johnny Depp, <laughs> aka Grindelwald, aka a super evil wizard Nazi that likes to kill non-magical people for fun. He gets arrested and he goes to magical jail. Newt goes back to London and he says goodbye to all his friends, Jake gets his memory wiped, and the story ends. All things considered, the movie is not very complicated. The thing is, the movie isn't even really that bad either. I'm among the three people in the world who actually kinda like it. The movie feels like a big departure from the other Harry Potter movies, the script is actually pretty good in some places, and the characters are all likable and relatable. I absolutely love the character of Jake Kowalski, and he shines as the best character in the movie. I really don't like the Johnny Depp twist, but I do like how Newt is kind of a small part in a larger story. He isn't a powerful or skilled wizard, and they make a point to show us that. When he goes into the final battle, he gets his ass kicked, and then he fails to save the person that he tried to save. I like that. It makes him more interesting than being the chosen one who's destined to save the day. It's not an amazing flick by any means, but I really like slow-paced movies with good scripts. The interactions with these characters are subtle, and they drive the film. You learn everything about these characters without long bouts of needless exposition. I know a lot of hardcore Harry Potter fans that don't really like this movie, but I'm a pretty big fan and I like it just fine. I think it's pretty cozy. Now the problem is, it doesn't feel like there should be a sequel to this movie. Like not a direct sequel. All of these character stories end in this movie, and that's where our first problem arises. The second movie now has to invent new reasons why these characters have to get back into the story. Now normally I just go straight into the next movie, but first we have to start with how this movie came to be so despised. So before we get into that, let's talk about the fall of J.K. Rowling. J.K. Just Kidding Rowling is the author of the Harry Potter books. She also wrote both of these movies. As you probably know, she is a gazillionaire, and she has control over all executive decisions in the wizard universe as a whole. Her power goes farther than you'd probably think, too. For instance, she figured, hey, Hermione could be black, so instead of just making her black in the story, Hermione is now black in the stage adaptation of The Cursed Child. Even though in the books, she's white. She literally only did this to appease the black Harry Potter fans. And as a black Harry Potter fan myself, yeah, it, it didn't work. This is something that JK likes to do a lot. She'll make a tweet and she'll retroactively change the story. Sometimes it's to make her world more diverse and inclusive than it actually was. And sometimes it's just weird. The first sign of trouble was back a few years ago when she revealed that Dumbledore was gay the whole time. 
Now, why didn't she just say so in the books? Well, because he wasn't gay in the books. She changed her mind later. She later revealed that there was also a secret Jewish Hogwarts student in the books the whole time that we never hear about, and his name was Anthony Goldstein, which is probably the most stereotypical Jewish name I've ever heard in my life. Why wasn't Anthony Goldstein in the books or movies? Because he isn't real. She made him up later when people asked her why there weren't any Jewish kids. The problem isn't that she has a political agenda, as some might say. The problem is that she wrote an all-white, all-straight story in the 90s, and she's embarrassed about it now and wants to pretend that it was secretly diverse the whole time. I'm not mad that you made a story about straight white kids. I'm just mad that you keep lying to me. But even though she's clearly lying, the fan base, for the most part, didn't really make a big uproar about this habit until very recently. And nowadays, things have gotten even more insane with her going so far as to say shit like this. Hogwarts didn't always have bathrooms. Before adopting muggle plumbing methods in the 18th century, witches and wizards simply relieved themselves wherever they stood and vanished the evidence. Jesus. And beyond that, we have the official sequel to the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, a story where Harry's son goes on a time travel adventure to stop Cedric Diggory from being killed by Voldemort. I wish I was making that up. So no, The Crimes of Grindelwald isn't her first failure, but despite all that came before it, I think it does stand as her biggest failure. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Let's talk about what happens in The Crimes of Grindelwald. So Crimes of Grindelwald takes place a few months after the first movie. The main idea behind this series as a whole is that for some reason J.K. Rowling thinks we really need to know about Grindelwald and all of his evil deeds. A character that's only briefly mentioned a few times in the original series. The thesis of this series is based on an unseen event in the books where Dumbledore and his secret gay evil lover Grindelwald had a duel long ago. A duel that was recorded as the craziest most badass wizard duel of all time. So now naturally we need a reason to make this story happen on screen. But instead of just making a movie about Dumby Dore and Grindelnuts, we have a movie about Newt Scamander, who has almost nothing to do with this conflict. You know, when I was a kid, I kind of always just assumed that Newt Scamander was just a guy who wrote the monster book. At no point did I think that he was instrumental in the first Wizard World War. So this movie opens up with Grindelwald, who is still in Wizard Jail. But he has to be moved to another Wizard Jail. Now first, I'll mention how this is one of the most overused tropes in any film. An evil character is captured and being safely stored in jail, but for some reason we have to drive them to another jail and give them an opportunity to break out. But this isn't even the worst part of the opening scene, if we're being honest. The worst part to me is that this is a world where people can teleport like it's fucking nothing. But instead of just apparating him to the other jail or using a port key or using flu powder or teleportation toilets, they have to drive him on a flying carriage. You guys have so many faster and more convenient ways to get around, but I guess this is what we're doing, so whatever. Anyway, so this Grindelwald that we're seeing right now is actually not Grindelwald at all. It's actually one of his followers. The real Grindy switched places with him before the movie began. So this breakout scene is just Grindelwald coming back to break out the guy who broke him out earlier. And this is just really unnecessarily complicated. This is the first scene and the movie is already being stupid. Now you could say that this scene exists to show us that Grindelwald values the loyalty of his followers. After all, he's not even in jail anymore, but he went back to save this guy. And that's what I thought at first, but then Grindelwald looks at this lizard that helped him escape, and just to show us that he is indeed evil, he just throws it out the window. Anyway, right after this super dark and bleak intro, we see Mr. Salamander again, playing with his cute Pokemon. This moment stands out as being a little too cute right after we watched men drown and fall to their deaths. This is actually a problem with the whole movie. I'd say 90% of the movie is violent or depressing, but then we have very brief scenes of Newt and his cute mascots doing cute things. It just does not fit. The tone of this movie is all over the place. So anyway, now Newt is in the Ministry of Magic, and why is the camera so close to these characters? Can we, can we back up, please? God damn, now I know why he doesn't like other people. They don't give him any space. So Newt is here because he's in trouble for causing havoc in the last movie, so the big important wizards tell him he's not allowed to travel internationally anymore. But they say they'll get rid of his travel ban if he joins the government as a wizard cop. 
But why? Why do they want Newt to be an Auror? He's not a very good spellcaster, and he's a weirdo who doesn't even get along with people. They specifically want him to help take down Grindelwald. But, but why? Why do you think he'll be any good at this? And why is that the only condition for lifting his travel ban? What's wrong with letting a magical zookeeper go to Guam? The movie is literally just inventing a fake reason to pull this character into the story. The whole arc for Newt in this movie is that everyone tells him he has to pick a side in this conflict. But why? He, he just wants to do his own thing. He's a fucking zookeeper. Why would either side even want him this badly? It's only been 12 minutes so far and everything has been stupid. And to top off the stupidity, it's revealed that Ezra Miller survived exploding in the last movie. Everything has been kind of dumb so far, but this is the first incredibly stupid thing that we hear. Because he fucking exploded. The whole idea of the last movie is that Ezra Miller can't survive. He was destined to die. They say the obscurus disease disorder thing is not something you can just walk off. But now, he's just fine, and he doesn't even have that problem anymore. And they never even ask for an explanation. We never learn how he survived exploding, and we don't learn why he's not at risk for exploding anymore. We just have to accept it as the truth. Who's writing this stuff? Oh wait, I remember. In the next scene, we watch Grindy Goo as he breaks into a muggle house and kills everybody inside. And then he kills a baby. 15 minutes into my Harry Potter movie and we've killed our first baby. And yes, I did say first baby. I would also like to point out that Johnny Depp looks absolutely goddamn hilarious in this movie. When I was a kid, I just assumed Grindelwald was like a normal looking guy. But in these movies, he looks so odd for no reason. Because we see Grindelwald in the original Harry Potter movies and he looks like a regular human being. We also see what he looked like when he was younger, and he looks like a regular human being. You don't just naturally grow off looking like this. Anyway, so now Newt meets with Dumbledore, who's played by Jude Law. And all things considered, Jude Law is playing the character really well. He has almost the exact same line delivery as Michael Gammon in the other movies. The purebloods think he's the last of an important French line. A baby whom everyone thought lost. The tale is thrilling, if I say so myself, but now is not the time to tell us. However, I don't know why he goes from dressing like a normal member of society to dressing like, well, like a fucking wizard. I don't know, I guess he got old and he just wanted to wear pajamas to work. To be honest, I can relate to that. So Dumbledore tells Newt that he needs him to go after Grindelwald in his stead. And I ask again, why Newt? He is just a zookeeper. The movie is so concerned with making Newt seem more important than he is, but at the end of the day, he's just a guy. At this rate, they could get any other wizard to do this stuff instead of him. I'm sure there's plenty of skilled wizards who would be glad to help out. Newt just doesn't want to deal with any of this shit, and I don't think it fits his character to take part in this conflict at all. Now, since Newt is being forced into this story for no reason, we now have to force in Jacob and Queenie too. They go visit Newt, and they reveal that Jacob's memories just came back. He says that the potion only erased his bad memories, and since he didn't have any bad memories, he's fine. And this is the dumbest fucking explanation I've ever heard. This is an enormous retcon and it doesn't even make any sense. Why is this memory wiping potion so flimsy? At that rate, everybody's memory should just come back. So we retconned Ezra Miller exploding and we retconned Jacob losing his memory. And you can't just put emotional scenes into a movie and then undo them when you don't know how to address them in the sequel. This is already some of the worst writing ever, and I would like to point out again that the movie just started! Anyway, Queenie and Jake are getting married now. Except, no they aren't. Queenie put a spell on Jacob to kidnap him and marry him against his will. So now instead of being a feisty but kind-hearted woman, Queenie is a fucking psychopath. She says that he gave her no choice but to brainwash him. Now I rewatch these movies one after the other, so I have to say that this is not in character for Queenie. Like I said, none of these characters are written the same at all, except for Jacob, because he's not really a complicated person. And yeah, he has no reason to be in this movie, but he's also the only likable person here. And he also has the one good line in the whole movie. I got my own problems. It's also revealed that Tina apparently is mad at Newt now because she read fake news that claimed he was getting married to the other girl that he knows. What the fuck? This plot point is so unimportant. 
It contributes nothing to the story at all. This movie just started! I should now mention that in the next scene, we learned that Nagini, Voldemort's pet snake, is actually a sexy human woman. And when I tell you that that's one of the least strange aspects of the movie, I want you to know that I'm being serious. However, what doesn't make sense to me is that she's a circus attraction. Her circus performance starts and ends with her just turning into a snake. I mean, I thought people can already do that though. People can just turn into animals all the fucking time. Now I do have to mention though that JK Rowling claimed in one of her infamous tweets that she came up with this Nagini backstory 20 years ago. N no you didn't. Why are you like this? You know everybody's making fun of you, right? So in this scene, we find out that after Ezra Miller exploded in New York, he joined the circus and he's now in Paris. Anyway, Tina's looking for him because she thinks he's still dangerous when she meets this guy named Kama, who reveals that he also wants to find Ezra Miller because he thinks they're related to each other. I mean, okay. So let's just summarize real quick what's happening so far. This is the end of the first act. So far, Newt and Jacob are going to Paris to meet Tina because Newt wants to tell her that the news article she read was fake and that he's not getting married because he doesn't want her to be mad at him. Jacob wants to find Queenie who ran away and tried to find Tina after she got mad at Jacob for calling her crazy because she tried to kidnap him and marry him against his will. Tina is still looking for Ezra Miller so she can arrest him because she thinks that he's going to explode uncontrollably, but she doesn't know that he's not going to explode uncontrollably anymore. This comic guy secretly wants to kill Ezra Miller for unknown reasons. Ezra Miller is traveling the world to find out who his parents really are. Dumbledore is in Hogwarts waiting patiently for Newt to... Actually, I don't know what Dumbledore is doing in this movie. Grindelwald is in the house he stole in Paris waiting for Ezra Miller to go to him because he still wants to tempt him to the dark side, but he says he doesn't want to approach Ezra Miller himself, except he approaches him anyway because J.K. Rowling probably forgot that she had him say that. The point is that this movie has way too much stuff going on, and things are only going to get worse. So anyway, to get to Paris, Newt uses a port key because him having a travel ban is the most unimportant element of the plot. There are multiple instances in this story where I could just remove entire plot elements and the movie would be exactly the same. Oh, and also he uses the Accio charm to bring one of his Pokemon back to him, which is not possible because the Accio charm doesn't work on living creatures. You know how I know that? because she taught me that. Anyway, Queenie's in Paris and she can't find Tina, and her and Jacob aren't talking anymore, so she gets lost. But she somehow finds herself in the presence of Grindelwald. Man, this guy is so lucky that all the major characters have a way of finding themselves to him. Next, we see Newt and Jacob meet with Kama because they believe that he knows where Tina is. And he sure does, because he kidnapped her and threw her in a fucking dungeon off screen. He tries to do the same thing with Newt and Jake, but then he passes out. Well, that's convenient. After that, we watch Newt catch a new Pokemon because the movie really wants to remind you that it's called Fantastic Beasts 2. While this is happening, the Ministry members from the beginning of the movie show up to Hogwarts to ask Dumbledore if he can fight Grindelwald for them. And he says, no thank you, and then they tell him not to be in the movie anymore. Oh, and also Professor McGonagall is here, even though the movie takes place in the 20s, and she was born in the 30s. And if that's not enough, she's also in a flashback that takes place in the 1910s, so fuck me, I guess. In this flashback, we see Zoe Kravitz's character, Lita Lestrange, and we see her and Newt as kids, and we learn why they like each other. Now, since I like giving credit where it's due, I will say that the kid who plays Newt in the flashback is pretty perfect. Like, he looks the part, he acts the part, he's just really good. Oh, and also, this flashback is insanely long. It's scenes like this where you really start to think about how messy this movie really is. Anyway, before Dumbledore leaves the movie, we see him also have a flashback where he remembers the time him and his boyfriend created a magical butt plug that makes it so they can't fight each other. Because, you know, the last thing this script really needed was a ridiculous MacGuffin for the characters to try and get from the bad guy. In the following scenes, we have Newt helping Tina find Ezra Miller while they dance around whether they like each other or not. They break into this library vault thing for information and they meet up with Lita. And then they get attacked by magical cats that are supposed to protect the government vault. And I'd like to point out that Lita and Tina are both government agents. Is there any other way to resolve this situation? I guess not. I guess we just need a dumb action scene to break up the monotony. Luckily, Newt summons one of his Pokemon and he uses its special ability to literally teleport straight to where the plot is happening. 
Now, if you guys have been paying attention, you may notice that most of the time, these characters just appear where the story is going to be. Anyway, Kama is here too for some reason, and so is Jacob, because he got bored with not being important in the movie, so he wandered around a foreign country until he found out where the plot was happening. Okay, I'm kidding about that one. He actually got vague directions from a zombie. Oh, and Ezra Miller and the snake chick are here too, because, like I said, this is where the story is supposed to happen. Most of the characters just ended up here randomly, and I should probably mention that we're about to watch one of the most insane scenes in the whole movie. This one scene inside this crypt fits so many plot twists and retcons into a 10 minute time frame that it feels like a bad soap opera. This scene alone is why I decided to make this video, because it truly shows how you don't write a movie. So all the characters meet here, and Kama immediately says this. My oh, little sister. Okay, so yeah, they're related. Apparently long ago, Kama's family was living happily in France, before a man named Lestrange got a little bit of jungle fever, and he decided to hypnotize Kama's mother into marrying him. Yeah, we officially have magical sex crimes in Harry Potter. You having fun yet? After she's kidnapped, she gives birth to his child, and then she dies. Then he decides that he's done with black women, so he gets married again and gives birth to a nice white baby that he likes way more. And that white baby is Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller is named Corvus Lestrange, long lost brother of Lita Lestrange, and Kama wants to kill him for revenge for his dead mother. Wow, that was pretty convoluted, but you know, I'm glad that we cleared it up. Corvus Lestrange is already dead! I killed him! W what Wait, why are we entering a different flashback explaining the plot? What is- what is happening? Okay, so Lita and white baby Corvus were sent on a boat to America for some reason. On the boat ride, Lita gets fucking sick of the kid and she switches him for another white baby on the boat. Then the boat sinks and the first baby, the real Corvus, drowns in the ocean. So Ezra Miller is just some other baby. This is where all these subplots converge and then they all end at once. Ezra Miller still doesn't know who he is, Kama doesn't even care about killing him, and Newt is literally just hanging out. Still here for no other reason than the fact that the story is forcing him to be here. The movie builds this mystery for about 80% of the runtime, and the resolution is that nobody knows anything anyway. Oh, and since the movie has spent all this time conveniently getting our characters to places where the story requires them to be, the crypt opens up and everyone finds out that Grindelwald just happens to be hosting a wizard Nazi rally inside. Yeah, okay, I guess he can tell the future by using his magical vape, so I guess he knew this would work out in his favor, but honestly, that just adds more questions to the table. And believe me when I say that this movie is not done being absolutely insane. So Grindelwald reveals to everyone that he kills muggles because he saw the future, and I shit you not, he wants to stop the muggles from starting World War II. He implies that if everyone joins his side, he can stop the Holocaust before it happens. Give, give me a second, guys. I just need one second real quick to say, um... What the fuck? You guys have officially made me lose my marbles! There is so much wrong with this that I can't even begin to explain. Not to mention that now we're rooting for characters that are trying to stop a man who's trying to stop the Holocaust from happening. Either way, we don't even have any reason to agree with him other than this. In the movie, he tells these idiots, oh, I don't, I don't kill people, I'm not a violent person. But the first thing we see, the first fucking thing we see in the Fantastic Beasts series is Grindelwald killing a bunch of people and the newspapers telling everybody about it. Everyone knows he's evil but they believe him anyway. And then they have the audacity to make Queenie agree with him. Kind-hearted, sweet Queenie watches him kill people right in front of her, and she decides that he seems like a pretty decent guy. I'd like to remind you guys that she can read minds. For someone who reads minds, she is very easily swayed by lies and dishonesty. So anyway, Grindelwald starts killing people and Lita decides to let Grindelwald kill her too. I thought at first that maybe she was sacrificing herself to save Newt, but no. She just dies for no reason. The strangest thing is that these characters can all leave this battle if they want to. 
but they just decide not to. Oh, and since the movie needs to end with something flashy and destructive, we have all of our remaining characters fighting a World of Warcraft raid boss. This seriously comes out of fucking nowhere. Grindelwald summons elemental dragons to destroy Paris, even though the whole reason he was here was to convince people that he isn't a violent maniac. If our heroes hadn't stopped his spell from destroying the city, he probably wouldn't even have anybody left to support him. God, this movie is so fucking stupid. So our main characters all decide to go visit Dumbledore and tell him what happened. And this shot is particularly funny to me because we see that everyone is here. Nagini, Kama, even fucking Jacob. They're literally just here to watch Newt have a talk with Dumbledore. I should also point out now that you are not allowed to apparate in and out of Hogwarts. You know how I know that? Because she told me! Anyway, Newt reveals to Dumbledore that at some point in the death and chaos, one of his Pokemon managed to snatch the magical butt plug from Grindelwald. So now Dumbledore is able to kill Grindelwald. And then they just leave and they go have tea. They just leave the other characters on the bridge. Where the fuck is Jacob supposed to go, Newt? You were his ride, asshole. Oh, and before the movie ends, we have the biggest middle finger of them all. Grindelwald talks to Ezra Miller, and he reveals to him that apparently, Ezra Miller's true name is Aurelius Dumbledore. He is Albus Dumbledore's long-lost brother. And based on everything we know about the Harry Potter canon, this is one of the most ludicrous twists of all time. Anyway, the movie's over now. So yeah, this movie is absolutely bananas. It's very hard to come up with things that I actually unironically enjoy in this movie. I think the best praise I have is that the actors aren't really doing a bad job. Everybody's giving it their all. And plus, I do like the soundtrack, but none of that matters because the movie has one of the worst screenplays of all time. This movie wasn't tampered by the studio. It wasn't cut together with another director's vision. This is the entire vision of J.K. Rowling and David Yates, untouched by anyone else. None of the characters act like they did in the last movie, and the plot just comes to the characters despite the fact that it feels like these events shouldn't even be related to one another. I love seeing how one movie can be this much of a convoluted mess. There are more retcons and plot holes in this movie than I've seen in a very long time. And in my final score, I think the only points the movie earned are because I couldn't stop laughing while watching it. So I'm going to give J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World of Harry Potter's Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them 2, colon, The Crimes of Grindelwald, a 3 out of 10. And I, for one, cannot wait for the sequel.